Let's open our Bibles now to the Gospel of John, chapter number 1. The Gospel of John, chapter number 1, and we will begin reading with verse number 19. John, chapter 1, and verse number 19. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are thou Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are thou the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said unto him, Who art thou? that we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And they, that, and they which were sent were of the Pharisees, And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou them, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elijah, neither the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. But there stands one among you whom you know not. He it is whose coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Way back in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, we find in chapter number 22 that God tested Abraham. You'll recall that God commanded Abraham to take his son Isaac up into the mount and to offer him as a burnt offering. And as they were making their way up the mount, little Isaac, who wasn't really little, but young Isaac, said to his father, Father, here's the fire and here's the wood. Where's the lamb? Where is the lamb? A question that has reverberated throughout the Old Testament. Where is the Lamb? As for centuries, the people looked for the Messiah. And Abraham responded to that question from his son. He said, God will provide Himself a Lamb. God will provide Himself a Lamb. That was the answer to the question, Where is the Lamb? Well, here in our text this morning in the Gospel of John, John the Baptist announces to the world, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So for centuries, where is the Lamb? Where is the Messiah? And now John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, announces he is here. Look, the Lamb of God has arrived. 
If you'll notice with me now in verse number 19, this is the testimony, this is the record of John the Baptist that the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? Who art thou? And John confessed that he was not the Christ. John was a man who was very humble. John was a man who was much like his Savior. Last week's Sunday school lesson, I think, or maybe it was my message, I can't recall. This morning's Sunday school lesson, I am certain, drew attention to the fact that Stephen reminds us of Christ. That as Christ was abused, mistreated, and his life was taken from him on the cross of Calvary, he prayed for his abusers. And then sometime later, Stephen a man full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, a man of good reputation, a man who who loved God, had an opportunity to preach to an audience who did not like what he had to say. He gave them an extensive Bible lesson covering many, many years. And their response was one of anger. Not everybody responds properly to the gospel. Some people get better, some people get bitter. Some people respond with anger, some people respond with uh, disbelief, and some people respond in joy. But Stephen's audience responded in anger, and they took his life. But Stephen prayed for those that abused him. As life was slipping from his body, he prayed, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And it's my hope, it really is, it is my hope that as people look at my life and examine my life and perhaps one day reflect upon my life, I hope they can say he was like Jesus just a little bit in some way. Wouldn't that be awesome if everybody could say that about you and I? that we remind them of Christ, and Stephen reminded me of Christ as he prayed like Jesus, as he served like Jesus, and even gave his life in somewhat of a similar fashion as our Lord did. Our Lord was humble. The Bible says in the book of Philippians that Christ humbled himself and stepped out of glory and come to this sin-cursed earth. He stepped out of the the presence of the Father and of holy angels and walked among sinners. He humbled Himself. The Bible tells us that the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. So not only did He show what being a servant was all about and being humble was all about by simply leaving glory, we also see it in how He lived and how He served and how He ministered. And we see those kinds of characteristics in John the Baptist because what was John the Baptist? John the Baptist said, I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice. Crying in the wilderness. John the Baptist would say, He must increase and I must decrease. John the Baptist said, The message is more important than the man. So when they say, John... You're different from most people, and John was different. He wore coats of camel hair. He ate locusts and wild honey. Instead of going to the city, he went into the countryside. Instead of blending in with the Jewish community and baptizing Gentiles into the Jewish faith, he was baptizing Jews unto repentance. John the Baptist was different. But he was a humble man. And because you and I all have some curiosity when we see smoke, the Levites and the Pharisees sent representatives to see what the fire was all about or to see what kind of fire was coming from the smoke. And they came with questions. And they said, John, who are you? 
He said, I'm not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. I am not the Savior. And they said, well, are you the prophet Elijah? Do you remember Elijah from the Old Testament? Oh, what a ministry he had. Matter of fact, John the Baptist and Elijah were a lot alike in their personas, in their ministries. Elijah was called up into heaven without dying a natural death. You can read about that in the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 2. Went up in a whirlwind of fire. And the Bible, we saw in the transfiguration of Christ, we saw Elijah there. Some think we will see him in the book of Revelation in the end times. Well, the Bible talks about, uh, well, Christ describes John the Baptist as Elijah. Not some kind of reincarnation or anything like that. that. That's not even real. It wasn't even Elijah coming back in the flesh, but simply the Bible says in the Gospel of Luke that, Christ, that John came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And John says, I'm not Elijah. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the man that we read about in our Old Testament Scriptures. He said, I am simply a voice. I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Verse 23, make straight the way of the Lord. What did John do? John came to prepare people for the ministry of Jesus Christ. John was born and from his mother's womb he was filled with the Holy Ghost of God. Now that won't happen again. It happened then. You and I received the Holy Ghost of God at the moment of salvation in this church age. But John was filled with the Spirit of God so that when he heard the voice of Mary that he leapt within his mother's womb. John the Baptist biologically from an earthly point of view was six months older than the Lord Jesus Christ as far as the flesh is concerned. Now you and I know that Jesus is eternal. He's always been and always will be. But as far as the human body is concerned, Mary was a relative of, of John's mother and Mary went to visit her. And when he heard the voice of the one that was carrying the Christ in her womb, he leapt. And John's ministry, John's purpose in life was to prepare people for Jesus. So what did he do? He went out into the wilderness. And he did something I am not so bold to do. And probably would be wise not to do it. He looked at people and called them a generation of vipers and more or less a bunch of rattlesnakes. I'd have to go out the side door, wouldn't I, if I got like that? <laughs> to call you a bunch of rattlesnakes? That's what John did. He looked out at a bunch of religious hypocrites and called them a, a brood of vipers. But here's what he did. He said, you need to repent of your sin. You need to turn from your sin and turn to God. And if you're willing to repent, you need to come and be baptized. And they lined the banks of the Jordan River and John baptized these people as they publicly were saying, we are repenting of our sin. And as John was doing this over the course of time, the Lord Jesus showed up. And we all ought to get happy when the Lord Jesus shows up. The Lord Jesus showed up at that baptism and He told John, John, I want you to baptize me. And John protested. He said, you need to baptize me instead of me baptizing you. I'm not even worthy to unbuckle the sandals from your feet. And Jesus said, suffer it to be. Permit it to be that all righteousness may be fulfilled. He said, it is the will of the Father that you baptize me. So John, imagine, can you imagine? You and I have been baptized, many of us, and we all have probably have witnessed baptisms. But can you imagine seeing the Lord Jesus with your physical eye? Or being John and having your hand upon His shoulder and taking Him beneath the waters of the Jordan River? It's no wonder that John was humbled. 
perhaps even feeling a little intimidated, no doubt maybe even feeling a little insecure. And that's why he protested, Lord, you ought to baptize me instead of me baptizing you. But he baptized him. And when Christ came forth from the water, do you remember what happened? There was a voice from heaven. A voice from heaven. In recent days here, we have witnessed some spectacular lightning in the sky. That might be a reason for our technological problems this morning. But there was some brilliant lightning in the sky. I was standing outside just to kind of watch the rain. And then when I saw the lightning, I took a step back and heard the rumblings of thunder and all of that. And that'll make your hair stand up on the edge. It can make you jump. How about the voice of God? The Apostle Paul heard the voice of the Lord Jesus and he fell on his face. The Apostle John in the book of Revelation heard the voice of Jesus and he fell on his face. And John baptized Christ and he brought him up from the waters. He heard a voice from heaven and that voice was the voice of the Father saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father said that this man is the Son of God. And then at that very moment, John witnessed the Spirit of God descending from heaven in the form of a dove and lighting upon Christ. And there at the baptism of Jesus, we see the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit were all there at the baptism of Christ. When John saw the Lord Jesus, he announced, Behold the Lamb of God. Oh, you Old Testament saints who had been looking for the Lamb, looking for the Lamb, where is the Lamb? John is able to say, had the massive, wonderful privilege of saying, Here He is, the Lamb of God. And not only that, he said, This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, in your Old Testament, you see a lot of lambs. There are a lot of lambs in the Bible. I think of the Passover lamb in the book of Exodus. When God had called Moses to confront Pharaoh and to demand that the Israelites be freed from their bondage, from their slavery, Pharaoh resisted and resisted and resisted. And then God sent Moses to Pharaoh with a message and to tell him that the firstborn in all of Egypt will perish. Since you will not let my people go, the firstborn of all of Egypt will perish. And the only thing that can deliver from that death will be the blood of a lamb applied to the doorpost of your home. And the Jewish people did as they were instructed. They, they, they took a lamb and slaughtered that lamb and they took that blood of that lamb and they painted the doorpost of their homes and when the death angel came they were delivered from death and destruction by the blood of the lamb but all of those who rejected that perished and they uh, the firstborn and the bible tells us there was weeping and wailing in egypt listen what does that passover lamb foreshadow it foreshadows the lamb of god the lord jesus christ who if you and I will put our faith and trust in Him, we will be covered by the blood and we can be uh, uh, saved from damnation and judgment. We can be saved from spiritual death. John the Baptist says that's the one. Moving on here, verse number 22. They said unto Him, Who art thou? We need to be able to give an answer to them who hath sent us. What do you say of yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He quoted to them Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. John the Baptist knew the word of God. Verse 25, and they asked him, okay, if you're not the Christ, if you're not Elijah, if you're not that prophet, and by the way, that prophet that's Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. Moses says, there's coming a prophet like unto me, 
who will be an intercessor, who will be a deliverer, who will be a mediator. That was a, prof a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, but they didn't recognize that. They didn't interpret that verse to mean that. So they went on to say, well, you're not the Christ, you're not the Elijah, and you're not even that prophet that Moses wrote of. Then why are you baptizing? By whose authority are you baptizing? Verse 25, Why baptizest thou, even thou be not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Then, verse 26, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. But there stands one among you whom you know not. He is coming after me, he is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. John, and you all have witnessed water baptisms, and I hope you have experienced baptism by immersion. If you've been saved, you need to be baptized by immersion, biblical uh, baptism. And if you've never been saved, then obviously that's the first step. There's no power in the water. There's power in the blood, as we sing, and as the Scriptures very faithfully proclaim. But John says, I baptize with water. And by the way, anywhere in the New Testament you see people being baptized, they're always in the water. They're not sprinkling, they're not pouring, they're down in the water. Jesus went in down into the water with John the Baptist, and Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water and were baptized. Matter of fact, the Ethiopian eunuch, I believe, said, here is great water. Here's a large amount of water. And if you're sprinkling and pouring, you don't need a large amount, do you? So they were, they were doing it the way the Bible instructs. And John was doing that. He was baptizing in the Jordan River. But he says, what I'm doing is a picture. What I'm doing is a symbol. And folks, as a pastor, when I baptize somebody, that is symbolism. It's obedience. It's an ordinance of the church. And we're to be baptized after we're saved. But what it does is it is a public ceremony, a public identification service where we're working out what God's already worked in. We're identifying ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and it is picturing our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. And you and I, we, when we get born again, we're dying to sin and we're dying to self. That old man is, is buried and put away, but when we get born again, we're raised to new life. And that's what water baptism is all about. Believer's baptism is all about. And we're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And John says, that's, I'm baptizing with water. But he said, there's one among us that baptizes with the Spirit. And no preacher can do that. No preacher can baptize you with the Spirit, no matter what they may tell you. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can baptize a person with the Spirit. Now, what is that all about, being baptized with the Spirit? Well, the word baptize means to be immersed. It literally means to be immersed. Baptizo, to be immersed. When you and I are baptized with water, we are uh, baptized in, in the water into the water, but when we're baptized with the Spirit, we're baptized into the Spirit. We're baptized into the family of faith. So when you and I are born again, we are baptized by the Spirit of God at the moment of salvation. We're placed into the body of Christ. So John here is being faithful to get people to think about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now stay with me, we're coming in for a landing here. Verse number 29, 29 to 34. Here we are at verse 29. The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Not just Israel, not just his future disciples, apostles. But the Lamb of God, 
was going to take away the sin of the world for all those that would believe. Now, what's the significance of that? What is the significance of Christ taking away the sin of the world? Now, let me, let me tell you something about sin that you know, but I want to remind you. Sin is anything that displeases God. Sin is anything that goes against the Word of God, that violates God's holiness and God's righteousness. This week, I was, I'm always dumbfounded when this happens, and I'm thankful it doesn't happen often. But I learned of a man who said, I am not a sinner, and I was not born in sin, and I don't like hearing this, and no matter what any of you people say, I'm not a sinner. Those statements lets me know that he probably doesn't understand the definition of sin. Sin is any thought, any attitude, or any action that displeases God. And for a person to say, I am not a sinner, I was not born into sin, is a person who's claiming perfection. Perfection. You've never been a smart aleck. You've never disrespected a parent. You've never grumbled and mumbled and said something out of the way. You've never lost your temper and did things you shouldn't have done or said, I mean, mercy. A person who can say those things, I'm not a sinner, I'm not born in sin, is either delusional or just trying to be outright deceptive. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. A-L-L. -L. That's those sweet little ball-headed toothless children that you and I bounce on our knees. They're sinners. And you should have known that at 2 o'clock in the morning when they were having bloody fits in there and you're trying to sleep. <laughs> I mean, it's just the way it is. We're sinners and it doesn't take long for us to recognize that in the little ones. And moms and dads are try to, will try to correct those little ones and if we aren't able to, to try to harness their natures, eventually they get to be big old people that cause you and I to have to lock our doors and watch our backs. And no matter how good a job you may do or your parents did, we're still sinners, but we may have yielded to societal standards in that we don't hurt people and steal stuff but we're still sinners. There's still a problem of the heart. Well, Christ came to deal with that problem. Jay Johnson deserves hell because I'm a sinner. The soul that sinneth, it must die, the Scripture says. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what our Savior did, the Lamb of God did, is He came to this earth in the form of a babe, placed in his mother's womb by an act of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, lived some 30-something years on this earth, sinlessly in every way, preached the gospel, preached that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man could go to heaven except through him. And then one day he went to the cross of Calvary and died on a cross. We call it the old rugged cross in our hymns. And he died there. And you say, well, lots of people die. You're exactly right. The, the graveyard's a testimony, and all of us are going to die. Every last one of us, we will die short of the rapture. But when Christ died, he died with a purpose. Not simply disease, old age, an accident, or a victim of some sort. He died with a purpose, and that purpose was to pay your sin debt and mine. He died on the cross by taking the wrath of God upon Himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. That's called the, uh, the substitutionary death of Christ. God the Father treated God the Son as if your sins and my sins were His sins. Now, none of us like to be falsely accused, do we? That'll get you excited and upset. None of us want to be blamed for something that we didn't do. To be quite honest with you, we don't even like to be blamed for the things that we did do. But we definitely don't want to be blamed for the things that we did not do. 
I remember sitting in a parking lot many, many years ago up in Virginia in a mall parking lot and a fundraiser, and I'm telling you, he was a good fundraiser. He was out there walking through the parking lot going up to cars with people in them, and uh, he looked very authoritative, had on his tie and a little thing on his belt and a clipboard. He beat on the door, and I was in the passenger seat, and he beat on the door, and my buddy that was in the driver's seat rolled down the window and said, Sir, he said, uh, I need to give you a ticket. And my buddy said, For what? He said, you're sitting out here in this car, blah, 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 blah. You know, my buddy was getting excited, and I'm sitting over there thinking, man, this sounds weird. He said, your name. I said, Jay. He said, I need to give you a ticket, too. I said, hold on now. <laughs> I'm not even driving this automobile. We were both getting worked up. And then he broke out in a big smile and said, I'm raising money for something or other. I don't know. He had us. We both opened up our wallets. He had us. I mean, well, I mean, that guy was good. But we were getting excited because we knew we had not broken any law. We were sitting there minding our own business and getting excited. We don't like the blame. The Lord Jesus took the blame. And more than that, He took the penalty. He took the penalty. That's why Christ cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? While He was hanging on the cross. God the Father turned His back on God the Son when God the Son became the substitute who experienced the wrath of God because He was treated as if your sins and my sins and the sins of the world were His. What a lovely Savior. Oh, the hymn writer. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Do you know Him as your Lord have you been born again? Do you know that you know that you know that if you were to die right now, you'd go to heaven? Do you have that kind of confidence? If you don't, you know what I'd like for you to do? I'd like for you to walk the aisle and say, Preacher, pray with me. I want to be sure that I'm saved. Will you show me in Scripture how I can be saved? I can do that in a matter of minutes. And if people need to run, we'll let them go. But, and you and I can stay and we can talk and, and, and get this thing settled. Let's pray together. Brother Thad, you come. Father... I thank you for giving us this opportunity in the Word this morning. I thank you for the ministry of John the Baptizer. I thank you, Lord, that he pointed the way to the Lord Jesus. I thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus coming to this earth and living a sinful, a sinless, perfect life and that he willingly died for sinners. He died for me. He died for these dear people in this place and around the world. And because He lives, we can live through Him. And God, I ask that You would just work about our hearts, that if we're not yet in the family of faith, draw us to salvation today. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Have Your will and way in our hearts, in our lives. And during this invitation, for we ask it in Christ's name, amen. Thank you.